this week on the Back Table Podcast. So you mentioned the uh, guest, and indeed I was a co-founder of the guest meeting, I actually came up with a name. And during that, I used to talk a lot about this and try to teach glue in these settings. And I had kind of a scale of different levels of complexity of embolization from beginners, perhaps gel foam in a trauma, pelvic embo, to what I call the master's level. And I think glue falls into that master's level, particularly because of this training gap and sort of the fear and the unknown. And I think the glue bullet is the top of that pyramid. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products, developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. This is Dr. Ali Behetti as your host this week, coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. And I'm very excited to introduce my special guest, Dr. Zeev Haskell. Welcome. Thank you, Ali. Really happy to be here. Dr. Haskell is a tenured professor of interventional radiology at the University of Virginia. His accomplishments include being the two-term emeritus editor of JVIR. Additionally, Dr. Haskell co-founded the Guest Conference on Embolization, which brings us to our topic for the day. We have a very sticky subject for today, the use of glue in peripheral applications. Dr. Haskell, could you give us an introduction to glue? Sure. Glue is incredibly common outside of the U.S. for interventional radiologists. It's a slightly different formulation than what we have, and it's uh, widely taught widely used, uh, but we've got a challenge for your U.S. North American users, which is it's been approved for use in the U.S. since the year 2000, but basically just for intracranial aneurysm use. So we have an agent that I know we'll talk about because I am a big fan of it. I use it in almost any occasion that makes sense to me, which is approved for use in humans, but does not have peripheral applications. And as U.S. practitioners, we're allowed to use things like that wherever we deem medically appropriate, but off-label use prevents a manufacturer from coming in and training people in peripheral use of glue. So we have this quandary of this difficult to use agent, can't get trained on it. Ah, that makes a lot more sense now why everybody talks about how you have to be trained in glue to use it, but it's also really hard to get training unless you used it in your residency or fellowship. So could you help me understand some of the indications for glue embolization? Well, so none of them are regulatory approved indications, but if we take that off the table and say, what about physicians? And what about interventional or endovascular uses? To me, it's one of the most challenging and yet most flexible agents because it can be formulated to be anything that disperses into four to five to six order branches. Imagine the Mississippi Delta and you want to flush something that's going to go to shores far distant reach all of them versus something that's going to stop the Mississippi right in the middle or just fire as the tiniest pinpoint cruise missile. And the viscosity and the means of injection allow it to be used along all these types of anatomies. I see. Okay. So what are some of the properties that make it a suitable embolic in instances where other embolics fail? You mentioned that it could reach very peripheral, but what are some of the applications that you would think of using glue first? So one of the most easy places to use it and to train is portal vein embolization. It's not incredibly common, but we have a, an ipsilateral puncture or a contralateral puncture to say occlude the right lobe excepting segment four. You can move a microcatheter in and out of branches and inject glue at a very dilute formulation. It's relatively low risk for the operator in terms of its use until it starts to collect down near the actual mouth of the catheter. And you can get these magnificent, beautiful castings that look like those neoprene rubber castings of airways and bronchi that we remember from our uh, med school days. Yeah, it looks like somebody 3D printed the portal vein almost. Yeah, exactly. And that, in that setting, that it might be a one to seven or even a one to nine mixture of glue to ethiodol, lipiodol. That brings us to our next question. Can you walk me through the basic technique of how we prepare glue? Well, I learned a very specific way from a colleague at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia, and I've used it ever since. And there are many ways to do this, but the first thing for me in setting up glue is to sort of separate it in my mind from the rest of the table, which means 
new gloves, separate table, separate set of equipment. So that kind of forms the mind to doing something different and unique. And I look for very specific things. I prefer to have a glass shot glass. I like to have mm -hmm. a plastic bowl that's uh, filled with uh, D5. And then I like to have one cc polycarbonate syringes. I tend to clip the edge off of the plunger so that I can tell by feel rather than just by a label that I have a glue syringe in my hand. And then I do the same with the three cc syringes, which are flushing for D5. I trim the ends of the plungers. And then in the US, glue comes with a little tantalum powder. And we don't need that for radiopacity because of course the oil is radiopaque. But the beauty of adding a little bit which means pouring a little bit of powder in the shot glass, squeezing that one cc tube of glue into the shot glass, and then adding your amount of oil into it and stirring it up with a blunt needle or something of that sort. I always put a little bit of that black powder in because it makes the glue visible in the one cc syringe, which means you know where there's air, you know what you have. I see, I see. Okay. When you're mixing it, do you use a special needle to mix it? So thrown onto the table are a series of uh, needles or blunt larger caliber needles to draw the glue up into the syringes for injection. And I might use the sterile cover from one of those to just stir it around. And then essentially draw it up into these uh, cartridges, which are these one cc syringes of glue in, in that dilution. And then you've got your arsenal, is it, or your gorilla belt of, uh, of, of your cartridges. <laughs> the uh, catheter is already in place, the micro catheter. The anatomy is figured out. We have a strategy for, if necessary, a rather rapid and sometimes overly dramatic removal of the <laughs> gluing micro catheter from the uh, base catheter. And then at that point, on a new sterile cloth on the patient, I'll bring over those syringes and begin flushing with the uh, dextrose solution to clear the base catheter. And during that flushing, it's a good time to sort of think about what's flow like, am I ready? Do I know the rate of injection? And then at one point when you're ready, you disconnect that, make a water to water connection between D5 and the glue and begin injecting. Okay, any tips on the injection technique? Well, certainly dead space of the catheter. So I remember the dead space of one particular catheter that's 0.34 and then I kind of measure up from there. Some of the larger high flow catheters we typically use are closer to 0.7 or so. So that's going to be space of glue that's going to be injected before we see it emerging from the catheter. So got to count if you're using say a 0.027 or 0.028 inch catheter that that one cc syringe of glue is going to result in only the tiniest amount coming out, which means having more syringes ready if the dilution is appropriate or having chosen the smaller gauge micro catheter so that you're not filling half of your catheter with just glue and then having to think about how to get that out, push it with more glue or push it as a sandwich with D5. So these are the kinds of things that occur. And then during the action injection, as you asked, the D5 is not radiopaque, so the catheter will be clear. The glue is radiopaque, so at that dead space, you'll start to see the catheter darken. And then it's just a matter of tailoring to the anatomy and this is the tricky part that's probably worth spending a little bit of time on and what happens next. Great. Yeah. So you kind of talked about in the portal venous system, but can we go through a couple of different case scenarios that you could present and how you would use glue differently? Yeah. So let's spend a second on portal vein just to finish that out, because for many people who are going to try to do this, this is a reasonably good place to get used to it. And the way that I do a portal vein embolization with glue is I'll have a long six French sheath, 25 French from an ipsilateral approach. If I'm treating the right lobe, as is most common, I'll have a 018 safety wire down into the superior mesenteric vein or splenic vein. And then through this long six French sheath, I'll pass a microcatheter paraaxially alongside that safety wire and then make a series of U turns into those portal vein branches that I want to treat. So I'll get as far as I want. And then with a glue that might be one to seven or some uh, Japanese experts will go all the way up to one to nine, start injecting it and letting it be pushed forward. And then during the injection, the operator has the ability to recognize how much you can actually push the glue forward by injecting more glue itself. In other words, the glue pushes more glue. And then the <laughs> important thing to remember is as it's starting to kind of drift back toward the catheter, that at some point, this stuff is going to solidify and you might actually begin to 
encompass your catheter. This is not onyx. So the, the catheter has to come out beforehand. The likelihood and everybody's biggest fear is that catheter is going to be stuck in a portal yeah. vein near zero because this stuff doesn't set that quickly. But it's more a matter of having it reflux into, say, the segment four branch where you might not want to have it go. I understand. Okay, so the working in the portal venous system, when you start very peripherally, you're able to kind of gauge how the glue is going to act, and that'll lead you to use it in, in other circumstances. So in that portal vein, if you're getting slick, then you can start deeper in and more peripheral, draw the catheter back during the injection. And then if you're really slick, you plan to drop into another branch and you can actually flush it with D5 and potentially advance it even without a guide wire into the next branch. If you're doing that, then you're moving toward sort of F1 level of uh, training because <laughs> you can clean and Excellent. flush. A completely different application and a very important application of glue is coagulopathic patients. We've all had these patients that we know are bleeding. We know that they're perhaps multi-trauma patients or liver patients. Maybe it's a biopsy bleed and coils are going to look good, but then just a few platelets drop off with that uh, progressive coagulopathy and it's going to recanalize. So having something that is completely occlusive in that setting is a really good application for glue. So then the question is, you're trying to land it on a dot, like a parachute. I used to be an active skydiver doing a precision landing where landing in a dish of pea-sized gravel, the pros land with their tiptoe, that kind of accuracy. So landing a tiny bit is the far end. And when we want to talk about bullets, we should get to that. Oh, great. By the way, it does not surprise me at all that among your many talents, skydiving is one of them. I've seen you rock climb and I can tell you'd be a very good skydiver. <laughs> Well, thank you. I may have finally retired having seen my reserve parachute, which by the way is orange recently. <laughs> okay. So we talked about portal venous system. We talked about coagulopathic patients. Any other indications that early users should be aware of? Well, I'll tell you the places that I use and then people will sort it out based on their experience, but I do virtually every bronchial embolization with glue. So perhaps the most dangerous thing to use is particles because of the difficult to see, but common shunts into the pulmonary uh, vein and people continue to describe cases of MIs or stroke because they're pushing particles across those. I've seen gel foam recanalize the very next morning. So I'm much more oh, bullish on being done. So I'll mix a, a glue that might be one to four in that setting and try to cast out into whatever that cavity, that uh, fungus ball is or something like that to really cover all those branches and get much further out. Another example that is a relatively straightforward one with a lower volume is uh, the uh, inferior epigastric injury and the ventral bleed. And those are often the, the INR of three or four or what have you. And in those settings, of course, a coil really doesn't do the job because there's going to be retrograde perfusion or all those little branches of that vertical inferior epigastric are sources of bleed. So in those settings, getting glue to get out more peripherally into those branches and by the same application if you're treating a lumbar for some sort of lumbar injury or an intercostal because of that end anastomosis at the end of the rib or the end of the lumbar artery, you know, it curls around to the other lumbar. You can really nail that down with glue and have it curve around that and get multiple levels with just one injection rather than struggling to get into another one. So those are some applications where a cast of glue, perhaps at a one to three or one to four dilution can be just a simple game winner. How much do you typically inject in those scenarios? So bronchial is like uh, lumbar is like rib in terms of vessel size and length, which means it's probably under a cc and a half, which means a single ampule of glue in that one to four dilution, plenty. The real question is, is not having it encompass the catheter and pulling a tiny little bit of glue ball or what I call the glue tail. That's the thing to fear, which means it looks like it's forming well, you don't realize that it's slightly solidifying around the catheter, not to stick it in place, but slightly. And then when you draw the microcatheter back, it pulls a little bit of glue back. So it's very important to be able to strip that off. So perhaps an image to paint in listeners' minds, if you've got your Mickelson catheter in the bronchial artery, or you've got your Simmons or your uh, sauce or your Cobra catheter in the mouth of the lumbar artery, and the microcatheter a fair ways out from that, 
if you have the misfortune of that little glue tail coming back on the microcatheter, you want to know that your base catheter is stable enough so that when you pull the microcatheter against it, it'll strip it off and leave it behind in the target vessel. That's an important skill. That's the dramatic ripping out of the microcatheter to shear off that glue tail, correct? Or in that setting, it might be a little bit slower as you want to control it. But, you know, being aware means you're in that moment and you can make that decision, yes. All right. We've talked about kind of lumbars, coagulopathic patients, portal vein embolizations. I do remember using it with you during fellowship and this might be a good time to talk about the glue bullet where we used it for renal pseudoaneurysm. Can you walk me through the glue bullet? So you mentioned the uh, guest and indeed I was a co-founder of the guest meeting I actually came up with a name. And during that, I used to talk a lot about this and try to teach glue in these settings. And I had kind of a scale of different levels of complexity of embolization from beginners, perhaps gel foam in a trauma, pelvic embo to what I'd call the master's level. And I think glue falls into that master's level, particularly because of this training gap and sort of the fear and the unknown. And I think the glue bullet is the top of that pyramid. And the glue bullet basically is a one cc syringe in which, which you vertically load the majority of it with D5. And then just like that mix of beer that you can get in a bar, the black and tan or whatever is being mixed, you put that tiny amount of glue at the very top of it. How much glue? Like 0.1 cc? The amount that you think is your, is your embolic. It might be 0.1 if okay. it's a longer area, but what kind of caliber bullet would you like? If it's a distal SMA branch and we're trying to take out something at a vasorecta, then it's not going to be any more than 0.1. It's just that. And then you've got to hold it vertically and be prepared to quickly move to the microcatheter and then inject it. And this is injecting a tiny rocket of glue. This is the nose cone on a missile of D5 that's being pushed to that point. So I did this with one of our fellows about a year and a half ago, very skilled. And I said, now understand that, you know, I trust you. This is a really challenging thing. And we're going to do the most delicate use of glue. So I'm going to load it for you. We're going to bring it. And you're just injecting this amount. And that's it. And that fellow took that syringe, held it carefully, and then injected nearly the entire 1cc syringe. As I <laughs> leaped back in horror because <laughs> that was basically spraying it everywhere. What's the proper way to inject a glue bullet? Like you're pushing a coil of a fixed length. Mm, okay. And not firing the entire following four centimeters of delivery catheter behind the detachable coil out into it and kicking back. You're just pushing out that little bullet. And this really lets you drop a spot of glue into one spot. It's incredibly effective. It's also a way to finish off a coil where the patient may be coagulopathic. You're running out of ground by backing up and, it, and it's just not occluding. Mm -hmm. So that bullet will actually stick just like uh, EVOH does right on top of that coil. So it's a, it's a superb finisher as well. Now, wow. the concentration of the bullet is worth talking about because we talked about sort of the easy end of one to seven, one to eight, where it's going to take its time polymerizing. You can go out and climb a rock, come back. It's probably still hardening. The bullet may be two to one oil to glue or okay. one to one oil to glue. Or if you're really at the pro level, it's two glue, one oil. Whoa. Okay. Now you're blowing my mind here. More glue than oil. Okay. All right. <laughs> that is, the, that, that is dare I say, the crux of glue, which is a, a, a two to one glue to oil bullet. And then All you're right. basically just okay. stamping out that spot that you're putting out that cigarette right in that spot. How do you decide the concentration of the glue bullet? It's any of those ranges, but I think it's important to understand that it's got to be more dense and that we're delivering a tiny particulate of glue, if you will, basically a, an immediately occlusive embolic and we want it to stay where we drop it, which means one to one or two glue to one oil. But if people are going to try this, I'd say working with one to one is the place to be. And again, find a place to practice. Yeah. Other than portal venous, any other suggestions of where we could kind of start incorporating this? A great place to practice a bullet is exactly like you said, portal venous. Another great place to practice a bullet is any of the other types of applications where we said, you might burn another microcatheter by mm -hmm. using that and having to regain purchase, but you're not going to harm the patient, uh, assuming that you can get access again, that that's also very secure. Maybe the microcatheter is only one centimeter beyond the base catheter or something of that sort. 
Um, but there are a lot of applications where this can be safely done. It may be advantageous to that patient. And it also provides that base of experience because we always say that you want to practice and get good in the non-critical situation. So when it's really game on, that skill is there. That is such a good teaching point. You cannot ever let an opportunity to practice fly by. Those are few and far between sometimes. Well, anything else we should know about the glue bullet before we move on? This really shows up the value of the, uh, the bit of the black powder, and you might add a little bit more so you can see it on top of it. Sitting on top of it, the thicker the glue, the less likely it's going to dissolve and start to descend into the, into the oil. And if you're listeners in Europe, it's going to be uh, blue glue which is a, a very attractive Robin's egg color on top of your D5. That is great. Okay, so they don't use tantalum powder? What do they use? Uh, the most common brand is uh, Italian origin made by Glue Brand, though there are other manufacturers as well. Many years ago, I spent a fair bit of time trying to help them make a regulatory submission actually into the U.S. And ironically, years before that, with the manufact with the people who sell, the only glue available in the U.S. Spent a fair bit of time working on a regulatory approach to try to get a peripheral application. So I put a lot of work behind trying to get this, but it's always stopped because this is a Frank de novo application. It's a new application. It's a very long and the most difficult and costly regulatory process. And the incentive for manufacturers or for people who sell this is frankly pretty low in the U.S. as I've learned through both of these cycles. So the only way that we're going to use glue is the type of thing that we're doing here and seeking ways where you can either apprentice or use it in the safe applications and build your experience. Well, I mean, you mentioned you've given some courses at Guest where you teach folks how to use this, kind of the master level course for embolization. Are there any other opportunities you can think of for either practicing young IRs or trainees to get their hands on this? Gosh, I wish there was. I was never incredibly satisfied with what we used to do at guests with boxes and models and things like that, because I thought it really simply did not prepare people for what they had to do. I think the best thing is, is to find someone where you can apprentice, where you can drop in a case or two and just get some of that standardization of how to set it up, how to have a setup that's easy for you, and at least see one or two cases. And I think for an, for an experienced interventional radiologist who hasn't used glue, that and then the simplest uh, use scenario is within their grasp. Yeah. What are some of the complications that you've encountered with glue? Well, excessive embolization. And the biggest risk, of course, in something like an end organ supply, like a, a distal SMA, where I might be using the smallest caliber of microcoil, trying to do the equivalent of a surgical clip, basically, mm -hmm. to a blood vessel that a surgeon could never find. They'll take out a foot instead then this is the kind of way that glue has to be applied. But if it spills into a larger arcade, then we've got an ischemic segment that's going to be a surgical excision. I've seen that once as a glue complication for sure. There are papers specifically on SMA use that were published in the JVIR from Korea and from Europe that describe this use. But again, those are expert hands. So that's the place to move toward. But I'll use it a lot in AVMs, in high flow AVMs, particularly ones that are more superficial where the use of EVOH may actually be palpable, people would feel it through their skin, mm -hmm. and in the worst case, may actually be visible in thin-skinned people. Oh, yeah. So for yeah. high-flow ABMs that aren't necessarily ones where, say, 50% alcohol solution might be the approach, as we've been taught by Dr. Doe, one of the world's experts in AVMs, then glues my stock in trade, and there it's a matter of what's the flow, what's the dilution. But over embolization and downstream spillage into non-target territory, there you go. Okay. And then we've talked a little bit about having your microcatheter stuck in your glue ball. What do you do when that happens? I've never had it happen. Okay, good. I've had situations where I've pulled a little bit harder and okay. captured those on flora. And those make a strong impression on people. But I've never pulled it to the point where I thought we're approaching the tensile breakage point of a microcatheter, or I wish I had a breakable tip microcatheter that is a neuro application or something like that. So I'm thinking about that a lot during the case, and hopefully I won't see that. I see. Any lesser known complications of glue that we might encounter when we're starting to use it? Well, if you don't have a prescribed method to empty it into, say, a shot glass, or you use, or you try to go from the little tube into a syringe with a little uh, mm -hmm. syringe to syringe connector, which is possible, I know one situation where somebody actually did that. This connection wasn't tight 
and they got a spray and uh, then an ophthalmology oh. visit. Oh, my. <laughs> so you haven't thought that I'd give you an operator uh, uh, risk, but yes, this is glued just like the old uh, commercials where the guy would uh, stick his helmet to uh, a construction helmet to a board and then hang underneath crazy glue. There you go. Glue, occupational hazard. You heard it here first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, anything else? No, nothing else so specific to its use. All right. Is there anything else that our listeners should know about this embolic? This is a pretty interesting time for liquid embolics. And I wrote an editorial about this um, a couple of years ago. It's called The Liquid Life. Because coming down the pike, some of them not known to the public, some of them known to trialists, and some of them known to people in startups, there are at least three to four interesting liquid embolics that will probably make it to the US over trials or potentially approvals over the next one to two years. And they're all very interesting and very different from each other. And the goal is to have peripheral use applications. And they've all got very different characteristics and it may be somewhat adhesive, but for the most part, they're cohesive. They stick to themselves and not necessarily stick to the blood vessel, which is one of the principal characteristics of glue and also one of its advantages in the right setting. But these things can be injected akin to EVOH, or they may be pastier, or they may behave like long coils and a variety of other types of formulations. So it's going to be very, very interesting. And so, but I don't think it's going to replace the value of glue for me. Can you think of another application for glue that would be useful for our listeners? Type 2 endoleaks sac puncture. Direct puncture of the sac with embolization. I know traditionally I, um, I've been using onyx for those, but can you help me understand why glue might be better? So a very common approach in which that might be a five or six and a half inch outer catheter with or without a sheath and the base catheter and perhaps something to swim around it. And then the onyx is delivered through that. And you've got that hole. When I do a glue type two endo leak, then that may be in a CT room or it may be in a cone beam room where there's flora, but some combination of those. I'll do the entire case through a 21 gauge needle. I see. And that's incredibly cool, which means basically stick the sack cone beam yourself down into it if you don't have CT axis, and that's fine. And then this is where there's an advantage to cone beam because you immediately have flora. And then secure the needle in your hand so it doesn't move in and out of the sac, and glue can be injected and with the, a suitable concentration, which might be one to four, occasionally one to five, you can distribute tremendous amounts of glue that'll just pour throughout the sac and cast very large areas. So these are large volumes of glue. Might be three cc's, might be 12 cc's of dilated glue. Oh, wow. And then it's just the needle that comes right out. So you don't have any trouble with directability? Like you don't feel like all the glue just drops into one part of the sac? It disperses really well? So it's a really important point, which is can you pick the spot where you think the leak is from? And again, if you can target that entry site to say, I suspect that it's going to be perhaps this lumbar, which may be isolated, and I prefer to do a trans sac or I've tried to go transarterial and it's a hike up a hill that can't be done, then there are reasons to suspect perhaps one area. So I'll try to puncture as close as possible. And then it becomes very straightforward to envelop the area, ideally locally with glue. But the idea that glue is going to fill an entire sack and glue it solid, it's never going to be that case. Sure. Well, I mean, 12 cc's, you never know, right? Yeah, and there's some great papers on this as well. So it's not just the two of us talking. There's uh, at least one paper in JVIR on the use of glue for uh, addressing a type 2 endoleak in that exact way that readers can look to. For our listeners, we'll link to a lot of these texts that Dr. Haskell has mentioned in the show notes, so you can keep an eye out for those. Okay, well, great. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners about how they can incorporate glue into their practice? I think this has been a fabulous conversation because of the challenges of getting training unless you can seek or have been in an apprenticeship situation. It's a really valuable tool, and yet there's a gap in trying to use it, and there's tremendous fear. But we hit a lot of the great sort of places where you can use it, from the large volume dilute in the portal vein, great training place. Heavy AVM high flow users are going to be able to use glue, trauma situations, or hypocoagulable patients, such as the retroperitoneal hemorrhage or the liver patient with a bleed, those kinds of things are a great place. And then moving up that ladder to that most exotic, dropping a little point, almost like a, a focal glue coil 
are really good ways to think about how you can incorporate it in your practice. Great. What are some of the challenges of bringing glue into these smaller practices? Well, unfortunately, because it's a neuro-labeled product, again, for 22 years in the U.S., it comes at a very high price. So there may be resistance to getting it stocked in a lab that may have a limited budget for uh, implantables and uh, single-use materials like embolics. The other challenge is that there may be resistance to bringing it into places where there isn't neurointerventional because it's, strictly speaking, it's labeled just for neuro, and that may be a challenge to get over. Now, there's plenty of literature, for example, for portal vein embolization that shows not only advantage, but superiority of glue over other agents. So you can use these kinds of things to argue why this is best for patients in these applications if it isn't available to you. But we have to acknowledge that that may be an issue for some people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cost is on the mind of most hospital systems these days. So th thank you for pointing that out. All right, Dr. Haskell, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I often in my practice get asked, have you ever done that? And I often say, I've done it once with Dr. Haskell. <laughs> So uh, I, I hold my training with you near and dear to my heart. Thank you for being a guest on our show today. Dr. Behetti, it's a tremendous pleasure. And in return, I'll tell you that I've rarely seen a more gracile climber than you. Thank you again for having <laughs> me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Zubi Sayad, Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.